This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the City of Eau Claire. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. We will call this meeting to order. Uh, welcome to the February 3rd, 2020 meeting of the Eau Claire Plan Commission. This meeting is being broadcast live by uh, Valley Media Works on Charter 994, WRFPLP 101.9 FM, and online at v valleymediaworks.org. The Plan Commission attempts to conduct its public hearings in a relatively informal manner within the constraint that we must deal with the issues before us in an orderly and businesslike fashion. We give the applicant an opportunity to speak first, then others, either for or against the proposal, are each permitted to speak once. We do request that everyone restrict their comments to the issues before us, avoid unnecessary repetition, and be prudent in the use of time. We want to be sure that, that we have adequate time to review and discuss all items with equal diligence. Please remember to turn your phones to off or silent uh, during the meeting so we're not interrupted by that. If you do plan to speak tonight, there are yellow slips of paper on the back counter. If you would fill those out kindly and turn them into Mr. Petrie up in the front before you come and speak, and then give us your name and address uh, when you come and speak. We have two items on the agenda tonight, which are actually related um, regarding the, some park issues. Um, those two items are uh, for public hearing, then we have several others for public discussion. Um, and with that, we'll begin the meeting with item number one, which is a public hearing for recommendation to the City Council to recommend approval of an amendment to the 2018-2022 Park Open Space and Recreation Facilities Plan to include the Princeton Valley, or Princeton Neighborhood Park. And uh, Mr. Allen will present here for items one and two, um, which is related. All right. Thank you, sir. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, again, before this evening, uh, two separate items, uh, three technically. Uh, the two re rezonings are essentially rezoning uh, from R1 to P public, and the public zoning is related to uh, the park improvements <coughs> related to the project. But to begin, uh, we'll start with a review of the five-year parks plan amendment to 2018 to 2022. Uh, park and open space master plan uh, as you see on the map it's agenda item one and it is uh, obviously related to a uh, citywide uh, parks plan uh, more specifically related to item two geographically speaking with uh, the Princeton Valley Park improvements you can see here um, and actually before I continue if I may uh, the uh, community services director Jeff Pipp Pippinger is here this evening uh, and is available for uh, questions uh, after my presentation here, uh, if there's some specific questions related, uh, primarily to the, uh, the Parks Plan Amendment, but uh, also to the Princeton Valley Park as a whole. So uh, with that, uh, you can see on the map here, uh, the, the full map, the uh, Parks and Greenways Plan uh, from Chapter 5 of the Comprehensive Plan was included in your packet and the applicant for all these items uh, before you here is the city of Eau Claire. So with that, uh, the city is proposing to amend the 2018 to 2022 Park Open Space and Recreation Facilities Plan, or Parks and Open Space Master Plan, uh, to include the Princeton Neighborhood Park in the Neighborhood Park Classification section of the plan. Uh, the park consists of two parcels along West Princeton Avenue that were graciously donated to the city uh, last year by Mr. Neil Hasselwander uh, and the comprehensive plan again a uh, portion here is shown on the screen uh, identifies the future neighborhood park actually at this location it's uh, shown here in the list as item number 62 it included the key there it's kind of a zoomed in portion of the the map highlighted there in the yellow circle uh, identifying that uh, relative area uh, related to the Princeton Valley Park uh, bouncing over to the Parks and Open Space Master Plan, 
uh, there it's kind of more of in a green circle, uh, just showing the general area where it'd be proposed. Uh, the green uh, shapes, bright green shapes on the map, uh, again, this is kind of the north half of the city, just to zoom in a little bit, uh, identify the neighborhood parks. So this is a map that would be updated as a result, uh, oh, as a uh, positive result of the proposed amendment. More specifically, uh, in the listing, this is just a clip. Uh, alphabetically, they're listed, the 2018 to 2022 listing of proposed projects. You can see here Princeton Valley is identified uh, to acquire property for park space and land. And uh, with that, uh, before I'll jump into the rezoning comments, I did want to mention that the uh, five-year plan is used by the Parks, Recreation, and Forestry Division of the Community Services Department. I should mention that the uh, new manager, Steve Plaza, is here as well, uh, and of, of the Parks, Recreation, and Forestry Division. And again, may uh, be able to answer some questions if needed. Uh, the plan is also a requirement of the DNR and other funding agencies in order to apply for grant funds for park and open space, open space projects. Excuse me. Uh, the Waterways and Parks Commission did review this request for the uh, amendment to the plan, and they have recommended approval. Also included in packet, uh, letters from Mr. Jeff Pippinger, uh, Community Services Director, uh, related to this request more specifically. So with that, if I may, I'll jump into the rezoning portion of the request. You can see that here it's uh, related to two parcels uh, off Princeton Avenue. The, the area as a whole, for the most part, is zoned uh, R1, single family residential, and the proposed zoning uh, is for the P public designation and also includes a general development site plan for the park. Again, the city is requesting uh, as the applicant to rezone two parcels of land along West Princeton Avenue is what this is here, from that R1 to P public, and then approve that general development site plan for the park. Uh, the two parcels, again, were uh, graciously donated to the city last year by Mr. Neil Hasselwander uh, to develop a neighborhood park. As noted uh, previously, the <coughs> conference plan did identify this, uh, a future neighborhood park at this location. Uh, we've included some maps, site plan for the park, and memos from the Community Services Department. I'll go through that a little bit more specifically here in a moment. Again, I uh, do want to mention that uh, there was um, quite a bit of discussion, dialogue related to uh, additional development of single family lots uh, further east of here on LaSalle Street uh, back in 2018, uh, kind of mid-2018. And uh, did want to mention again, uh, Mr. Hasselwander was uh, quickly and graciously agreeable to work with the city to identify these parcels, uh, to present them uh, as a donation uh, to move forward here uh, with uh, development of the park uh, for the neighborhood. So just wanted to again acknowledge the, uh, the work of uh, Mr. Hasselwander in this specific project as well as our city attorney uh, to kind of uh, negotiate through the specific parameters of that. And then of course, our community services department uh, for putting together what we'll see here in just a moment is the uh, proposed uh, plan for the park. So jumping ahead here, you can see aerial photo uh, showing the proposed area and parcels in question. And more specifically, some of the uh, uh, connections and uh, proposed uh, park areas. Again, the site plan here shows the neighborhood park extending on both east and west sides of West Princeton Avenue. The eastern parcel, as you see here, uh, more the square parcel, about 0.43 acres in size, uh, would include a soft surface play area, some playground apparatus, a small pavilion or shade structure with tables, basketball court, benches, and other uh, amenities. Uh, the western parcel, I'll jump back here, sorry, uh, about 0.7 acres, includes a small shade structure with tables. Uh, both parcels are connected by a trail system. You can see it there in gray. Oops, sorry, I'm jumping back. I highlight here more of the pink or magenta here. Uh, again, connected by a trail system that extends further to the west as well as the east 
and to the west there it connects to the High Clare development. Uh, you can see this is a little bit older aerial photo, uh, but to the west, a uh, 12 foot trail with a 20 foot easement dedication would connect over towards uh, McKinley Road area and then into the High Clare residential development. And then again to the east would connect uh, into the vicinity of East Princeton Avenue and again kind of along uh, the golf course property as it stands. So again, showing more specifically some of those amenities I just mentioned. And again, I uh, should also mention as well, the city has also worked with uh, the Princeton Valley Neighborhood Association uh, regarding the development of this concept plan for the park. And the neighborhood has uh, recommended approval of the plan. And as noted, the Waterways and Parks Commission has also reviewed uh, the application and recommends approval as well. So with that, uh, a lot to kind of introduce uh, the topic, but again, this has been going on for, oh, probably 16, 18 months to this point, uh, just to get to uh, the development of this park at this stage. And again, a lot of um, different partners working to collaborate to uh, make this happen for your consideration and recommendation to the City Council here tonight. Stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the Commission for Mr. Allen or Mr. Pippinger? Uh, Commissioner Bran Granlund. Uh, as much as I prefer pictures over words in the first place, um, I was just curious if there aren't any text sections that need to be edited in the parks plan. All of these were, seem to me, just map locations or colors and uh, on the what's identified as page 5.8 mm -hmm. of the plan, it would have to move number 62 out of place in order to be on the other list. Is Correct. There, is there there descriptive portions that need any editing in addition to those? Very good question. There, there are some tables and lists that would have to be uh, modified. Um, I mean, this may be a good opportunity to bring Mr. Pippinger up to respond to more specifics of the plan since he'll be the one uh, utilizing and uh, administering the plan. Okay. Good evening. Uh, Answer is yes. There are some uh, areas, especially in the neighborhood park section of the plan that we'd be updating that with the information for the uh, Princeton Park. And again, um, Mr. Allen spoke to this very well. I don't know if there's more that I could add to it, but uh, um, it, it is, we are looking at putting this into the classification of a neighborhood park versus perhaps a, uh, a smaller version of uh, maybe in, uh, of something different, but because it is in a neighborhood and it's going to, our hope is to have the amenities in this space that will mimic other neighborhood parks. Mr. Gregor. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pippinger and Mr. Allen. The, um, I guess I was wondering about the, the eastern part of this uh, proposed park and the um, kind of the border on to the north and east in particular where um, I'm not sure of all the details have been figured out exactly but is there is there some sort of plan for a fence or is that all planned to be open it's given there the golf course on the east and the house pretty close on the north currently what we have there is some natural uh, screening if you if you look there it's it's very close to the number four green on the golf course um, that is a par three so typically we're not having people teeing off with a with a uh, driver it's usually a, an iron um, but there are some natural vegetation in there that will be there for screening and we feel confident that we can if needed we can uh, actually plant uh, more plantings there. Any other questions from the commission for staff? If I may, Mr. Chair, as well. Yeah. Uh, neglected to mention, I'm essentially filling in for Mr. Pat Ivory, who would normally be presenting this tonight, but okay. he's uh, on vacation. So okay. uh, he was the one who put a lot of, actually put all the materials together. Uh, for your consideration here tonight, again, along with Mr. Pippinger and his staff, and uh, again, the concept here is uh, by CBS Squared. All right, thank you. And the City of Eau Claire is the applicant. Yep. All right, thank you. Thank you. 
Are there any members of the public who came to speak on on this item tonight? Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name's Ken Van Ness. I live at 2603 Yorktown Court. And uh, I missed a meeting, so I'm president of the Neighborhood Association. <laughs> in actuality, the uh, discussion of a playground in Princeton Valley goes back to the 1980s. And there's, uh, for many years, the uh, there was a skating rink that was maintained, a non-supervised skating rink that was maintained uh, right where the eastern part of that playground is being designed. And then there was a playground on the west side of the street that was run there during the summer without a shelter house or anything for many years. So it's not the first time that uh, a discussion of having a play area in Princeton Valley has come up. Um, our neighborhood is really excited about this development, so we urge you to support it. Um, we want to thank the city for the money that they have put into the design uh, so far. And uh, that we, the staff, uh, Mr. Pippinger and their staff have worked with us to come up with an agreeable um, design and include the amenities that the neighborhood has requested. Um, so I don't think that there's a lot of opposition. I won't belabor the point. We are in support of approval of both of these issues. Uh, I would say as an editorial note that uh, this whole area, uh, including High Clare and uh, the uh, development to the uh, west of that, uh, cries out for a parkland dedication ordinance. So if that ever comes up, I'd be in favor of that too. Any questions? Any questions from the commission? Thank you. Any other members of the public who came to speak on this item? <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Jan and Lou Fraze, 2516 East Princeton Avenue. So we're on the other, the east part of the circle there going around the golf course. I just want to point out that magenta, I don't know where that picture is, but there's a magenta line that goes up and actually is on a uh, ridge that I believe that you require to someone in some uh, entity of the city required Hasselwander to do it for retention pond behind the 27 new homes that he's building along East LaSalle. Um, and so that is a walking trail, and that's, that's very important. Lou and I are in a condominium out there. It's a very large condominium development. We have seven different associations, and we have a, kind of a affordable housing apartment building right there also. This is the walking. It's a big thing out there to walk and go the circle and to be able to get off the sidewalk and on that part is very important to all of us too. So. Just wanted to point that out. We are very much in favor of this because we have um, well over 100 new homes in our area. With High Clare, 87 maybe, and then Hasselwander's new 20 some. So we, we've added in the last year or so over 100 new homes. But that spurred us to get a neighborhood association going, which is very good. Very good, thank you. Any questions from the commission? Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you. Any other members of the public who came to speak on this item? All right. Um, so we will see if there is a motion to support item number one, uh, which is the amendment to the open space and recreation facilities plan. I move to recommend it to the council. Great. I'll second. Uh, Commissioner Wolfgram, thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll call a question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. Item number two is related, and we've already seen the presentation to that. The City of Eau Claire is the applicant. Are there any members uh, of the public who have anything further to say about this? It's uh, the related item just changes the zoning. All right. Uh, is there a motion? Commissioner Reynolds. I'll move uh, we recommend approval of the rezoning to the city council. Is there a second? Commissioner Christopherson. I, was, I would second. Great. Any discussion on item number two, the rezoning? I see none, so we'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes as well. Congratulations. Thank you. Look forward to Thank you. New Park. 
Item number three is a public discussion for recommendation to City Council to recommend approval of a replat for six proposed lots at Camden Place. Mr. Petrie. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, before you tonight is a replat of Camden Place, number two. It's located number three on the map on the north side of Eau Claire. The proposed replat is for Camden Place number two, located on Daisy Lane, currently zoned R2P. Uh, this was reviewed by the Plan Commission uh, in February of 2018, approved by the City Council and this commission. The lots that are proposed are to be split into twin homes, and this allows the developer to sell off these twin homes. Uh, there's three lots. Uh, currently duplex lots that they're going to create, create into duplex lots or twin home lots. CNM is the property owner and real land surveying is the applicant. Uh, this request um, staff would recommend approval. It does meet all of the R2 zoning district standards. This uh, replat will be on the city council for February 11th review. Uh, with that, I'd be standing for any questions this evening. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? Mr. Christofferson. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Mr. Petrie, were, was there any response from um, neighbors about this replat? Not any? that I'm aware of, no. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Thank you. Thank you. Is the uh, applicant here? Welcome, Mr. Bohan. Good evening, Sean Bohan, 1504 Sherwin Avenue. Um, I'm here representing uh, the developer, um, and I'm just here to answer any questions if you guys have any. Thank you. Any questions? I see none. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion on the commission for item number three? I'll move approval. Thank you. Mr. Peterson? I'll second it. All right. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call a question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. Congratulations. Number four is public discussion for recommendation to City Council regarding the approval of a uh, certified survey, survey map for one lot with right of way dedication at Venture Drive and County Line Road. Mr. Petrie. Thank you again. Number four is located on the north side, uh, pretty close to number three. Uh, it's in the Gateway Industrial Park, and they have the applicant along with Ayers Associates. Uh, this is a one lot CSM with right of way dedication. It's approximately five acres, uh, 4.97 acres, currently zoned I1P uh, within the Gateway Industrial Park. This uh, certified survey map is do uh, dedicating 40 feet of the right of way, which is existing out there. Here's a zoomed in uh, of the certified survey map. Currently, uh, it is one large parcel within the Gateway Industrial Park. Um, and they're proposing at this time to uh, lot off lot one. The parcel lot is 4.63 acres with the additional right of way, it's almost five acres. This is similar to other CSMs we've done in this area. Uh, it's just dedicating the right of way along the, the street. Um, the gateway board has reviewed this and recommended approval. Uh, staff would recommend approval. And also this would be on the February 11th a city council agenda uh, with the right of way dedication. Uh, with that, I'd be standing for any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Peterson. Is County Line Road entirely in the city or just the southern half? I believe this portion is entirely inside the city, but if you head to the east, I would have to defer that to the okay. city engineer, Ms. Ness. I'm not 100% sure if the entire to the east is inside the city. I have to agree with you, Mr. Petrie, that I believe the the County Line Road is all within the city limits at this location. And it looks like the 40 feet as opposed to 33 feet in width on the south half to the east would be 
adequate for the inter any intersection improvements that are needed? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Could you uh, go back to that other slide once? Is that red uh, line to the northeast of the lot, is that the city limits? That is correct. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Is there a motion on the commission to uh, approve item number four, the certified CBAR? Uh, Commissioner Peterson. I'll make a motion to approve the CSM with the right-of-way dedication. Is there a second? Commissioner Granlund. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? I see none, so we'll call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. Number five is public discussion for approval by the Plan Commission uh, to approve a master sign plan for an existing multi-tenant building at 1106 Mondovi Road. Mr. Petrie. Thank you. Uh, before you tonight is a master sign plan uh, for Artisan Forage located at 1106 Mondovi Road. Uh, it's number five on the map, which is located on the south uh, southwest side of, uh, of the city. Here's a current uh, aerial photograph showing the large uh, multi-tenant, um, multi, uh, we'll call it multi-tenant building. <clears throat> Before you tonight is a master sign plan. Uh, sign Art Company uh, is the applicant on behalf of the property owner. The current property is zone C3P. Um, it's also known as Artisan Forage Studios. Has many tenants within the building uh, with multiple entrances. The reason be for the sign plan tonight, uh, they're proposing five new multi-tenant cabinet signs on the front of the building. Uh, here's a, a photograph of showing what potentially could be added to that. Since there is so many tenants within the building, the applicant is proposing potentially to split some of the tenant buildings up. The first one would be, they're all four by eight. Um, and potentially have split between the, the two bottom ones. Uh, all the signs proposed are at 32 square feet. Uh, we're going to go over the existing signs that Arson Forage has put up um, throughout the site. This would be facing Claremont Avenue. Um, it's on the north side of the building. They're proposing five uh, four by eight tenant signs, like I mentioned. These would be cabinet signs. Uh, my understanding, they would be illuminatedly lit. Um, the applicant is requesting that Skull Shot uh, Coffee Shop be shown on number, f uh, on the, I guess it would be the fourth one in. At this time, that's the only one that is proposed that to go up, that far as I know. Uh, the existing sign that is shown uh, on the top uh, is there currently, and that sign, uh, is my understanding, is at 56 square feet, and that would remain in place. Um, they also are proposing a directory type signs. This is to list the entire tenants within the building and also give customers and clients a direction of where they would be located. Uh, these would be 34 square feet, uh, four by eight, six approximately. Uh, this one would be located on the west side of the building and it would be located near the entrance. Uh, the other two artists and forage signs as they were on the slides, they would remain in place uh, and identify the building as well. Uh, here's showing the elevation of those signs and where they would be placed. The Artisan Forage sign would remain um, in, in place. And here would be that directional sign directing uh, customers and clients within the building and what number they would be located on and which floor. <coughs> uh, this would be located on the east side of the building, which the Artisan Forage sign would again remain in place. Uh, that's existing. Uh, then they're also proposing uh, another directory type sign located on the east entrance, as you can see on the elevation. Uh, here's an overall view of what the signs would, where they would be and what they would be. Again, the five facing Claremont Avenue, uh, along with the additional, uh, the sixth sign would be the Artisan Forage. The two signs located on the east side along th highway th or facing Highway 37. One of them would be the remaining sign, the logo sign, and then the other one would be the directory sign. 
And then on the west side, uh, with the review tonight, they would be adding a directory type sign, and um, the two remaining artisan forge signs would be remain in place. Uh, as the staff report notes, this property is unique with a large building. Also, the addition that they did um, three years back is a two-story building, making it challenging for customers and clients to get and know where they're going. The directory type signs has 32 tenants listed within it. Uh, and it appears to be um, easily changed if the tenant does move out or relocate to a different building or a different site within the building. The sign code does allow multi-tenant buildings to uh, have multiple businesses as long as the plan commission approves the master sign plan, which is in front of you this evening. All the signs do, all the proposed signs do meet the C3 standards and would be reviewed with the uh, sign permit. Uh, with that, staff would um, recommend approval of the request that the applicant is proposing along with the property owner. The applicant is present in the audience if you have questions for him. Also, I would be standing for any questions this evening. Thank you. Any questions, uh, Commissioner Christofferson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Petrie, this is just more for my information. Obviously, because these meet standards, um, there are standards out there. But I'm, I'm wondering um, about what it means when they are, um, like these tenant signs, um, are translucent white polycarbonate faces with applied vinyl overlay. And so if you would just describe a little bit more about what that is and that what's the estimated duration of that, that kind of signing? And do we ha does our code also suggest when it begins to fade or something like that who how is that dealt with thank you sure uh excellent questions i would defer some of those questions to the applicant the sign company because he can go into details of how they're constructed now typically if a sign does start to fade uh the city sign ordinance um doesn't really address it too much but usually the property owner or the sign company does address it with freshing paint or re uh, new lights um, I do know that most of your national chains do change their signs every five to ten years. Um, some of them more often than that. Um, but typically the property owner would be more in charge of uh, making sure the sign's in good condition. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Commissioner Granlund. Granlund. There seems to be a lot of different graphics present on parts of the building. Um, most of them, I mean, there's some that appear just to be artistic graphics, but one of the photographs includes uh, the word Bennett. And I think any time that there's text combined with an image, uh, it's one that looks like a guitar on the garage door. Uh, I don't know if that counts. I believe that counts as signage when there's lettering involved. Um, that's a fairly large area represented there. Um, I just. And then there's so many different graphics applied to glass. I, I think I recall that the glass type display decals don't count as far as building signage goes, but I think that something on the scale of that garage door might also count as a major sign since it includes text within it. Is that my correct? Excellent question. Um, the way it, the city staff would review it, it would be those are potential murals. Now, I'm not 100% sure what Bennett means. That might be the artist that did the, the drawing. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but we would follow up with the applicant on that um, to determine what that actually means. Most of the murals in town, now there's been some that have been put up, and we have addressed them. But typically a mural is artwork that does not advertise the type of business or the the location of what the business does. Um, I believe the rest of the, the paintings on the building are more murals than signs. Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Petrie. I guess I'm trying to figure out um, with the directory signs, they, they appear to just be related to the building on the north. Is that all that is considered Artisan Forge, or is all three buildings, aren't all three buildings considered to be Artisan Forge Studios? That is correct. Excellent question. Uh, my understanding is the entire 
complexes consider Artisan Forage uh, Studios. Now, I'm not 100% sure why the applicant is not proposing any signs at this time, uh, but the uh, again, the sign art applicant is here. You can definitely ask him that question. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission for Mr. Petrie? Thank you. Thank you. Is the applicant here? Welcome. Good evening. Matt Snyder, 2933 Mondovi Road. Um, so I guess to circle back, uh, the longevity of the sign of a cabinet style sign, I'd say be approximately 15 years. Um, you know, the face, the vinyl graphics tend to wear somewhere between seven to 10 years. Um, the lighting method will be LED illumination. So you can bank on good, bright, even lighting for about 10 to 15 years, I would say. Um, and as far as the directory signs, uh, we included those in this proposal. They're not being sought at this time. Um, we, we had two different builders, Dram Builders and Mark and Johnson were both involved there. So we had a difficult time overlaying two different floor plans to match up and, and be correct with the tenant occupants. But um, the majority of the multi-tenant, smaller tenant spaces are in that northern uh, new, new addition of that building. So that's where the greatest need is for the, for the directory to find the tenants. Okay, any questions? Thank you for coming. Thanks. Is there a motion uh, to approve item number five, the master sign plan? Mr. Grenholm, Grenland. <laughs> Whatever, so moved. <laughs> Sorry. Is there a second? Mr. Obeyed. All second. Easy to say. Um, any discussion? All right, we'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That passes. Item number six is public discussion for approval by the plan commission. Uh, a site plan for phase one of East Hamilton Avenue and Gateway Drive, northeast corner. Mr. Petrie. Thank you again. Uh, before you tonight is a site plan for phase one. Uh, phase one includes 10 eight unit apartments. Uh, number six on the map shown on the east, southeast side of, of the town. Here's showing the overview of two phases on, located on the northeast corner of Gateway Drive and East Hamilton. Last year, we, this commission approved the west development, which is currently under construction, uh, west of Gateway Drive on the northwest corner of this intersection. Here's a zoomed in aerial showing uh, the proposed buildings. The zoning of the property is R3P. The, uh, the area in development tonight is approximately 5.7 acres. The entire parcel is almost 10 acres, 9.6 acres. The applicant is proposing 10 eight unit buildings. The first four buildings uh, are similar to the ones that are being under construction across the street. They are proposing with this phase to be detached garages. If you remember correctly on the across the street, they have no garages, they just have surface parking. Uh, in the narrative, the applicant is proposing uh, each unit having a space on surface parking and then also one space within the garage parking. As they transition to the north, there are six more buildings that are eight unit with attached garages for those uh, units. The, um, the buildings uh, elevations are noted in your report and also shown on the screen. They are proposing these would be the northern type buildings. Again, these are eight unit buildings, each having a two car garage showing. Uh, these would be the buildings that are on the southernmost part of the development of the phase. And these would have the detached garages and also surface parking. And then out uh, air in your packet is the aerial photograph showing the large parcel, which is almost 10 acres uh, in size. Um, the applicant is proposing uh, 
and the and narrative does note uh, with the first phase is two bedrooms with two bathrooms and also two bedrooms with one bathroom. Each of the unit having one car in the detached garage, as I mentioned, and one surface lot. The building elevations are shown on, uh, in your packet and on the screen. The parking requirement for this development is uh, 64 stalls and 80, uh, 68 are proposed. The second type of eight unit buildings, as mentioned, are the six buildings on the northern part att with attached garages. These are consistent of two and three bedrooms. Building elevations are shown. Uh, each of the units has a two car garage attached. And the applicant did count within his calculations for parking requirements, two, car two stalls within the driveway. Uh, the parking requirement would be 120 stalls and the site plan does note that they're proposing 192. The plan commission uh, in the past with similar developments like this sometimes uh, allows that, sometimes does not. Typically though, they have allowed it because if you have storage in the garage, obviously you can't get a car in the garage, so then you usually park in the driveway. Also, they've allowed it with uh, guest parking, similar to SC Sidersky's development on Kane Road. Uh, sometimes the garage stall is not available. The green space is noted at 35% uh, of the lots and the open space is 15%. They are proposing on the northern part, uh, a playground area, sports court area, recreational area. Staff is recommending that be built within phase one. The reason being is because if they add the uh, 10 unit or 10 buildings with this development and also across the street development, there'll be quite a, about a, a lot of new people within the neighborhood and we believe that that should be within phase one. The landscape plan does show uh, street trees, foundation plantings, and evergreen plantings along the east side. Uh, and the aerial photograph does show most of this is abutting single family homes on the eastern part of the development. Uh, bicycle parking is allowed within the garages. Uh, currently, Gateway Drive only has a bike path on the west side of the street that leads from Gateway Drive and heads south. Uh, as this aerial photograph shows, uh, parts of this area is it within the city of Eau Claire. Some of it's in the town of Washington, in particular across the street, and also uh, Kitty Corner uh, from this development. The applicant is proposing, going back to the site plan, a sidewalk along a portion of, uh, eastern portion of Gateway Drive uh, the engineering department along with the planning department is recommending that the sidewalk be connected between the two driveways on Gateway Drive. There is sidewalk within the site as well being proposed. Grading and drainage is noted in your report along with the public utilities, the traffic, and also transit. There is a few conditions that need to be met uh, with the site plan. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? <coughs> I see none. Thank I you. Got one real quick. Oh, I beg your pardon. That's okay. Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Petrie, the, I don't know if we could dive in a little bit into the question of the, of how um, the site plan ultimately at this, at this point, it has kind of a limited number of sidewalks and obviously there, these, these road segments here are are kind of like a rural cross section right now. And so I guess my question would be um, for Ms. Ness about how um, how you pr see this proceeding, like for what is best right now in terms of sidewalks along um, Gateway as well as East Hamilton as a, as a option at this point when we don't really have curb and gutter on the streets. Um, and I guess there's the, the trans transportation um, the TIA, the which stands for uh, traffic impact analysis. Yeah, traffic impact analysis. Um, so I guess how that all relates to together. That's my question. Okay. Um, right now, there is not sidewalk proposed along East Hamilton or Gateway Drive, with the exception of that northern portion along Gateway, and uh, both streets are rural cross sections, as you as you had mentioned. Um, the utilities along Gateway were uh, constructed in 1996, so relatively new utilities in that area. The 
MPO and Eau Claire County is researching, um, studying the extension of Gateway Drive North. Um, so we're waiting on the results of how that will play out um, for street improvements through that area, um, potentially uh, what that urban cross section would look like. And at that time, sidewalk would be required with uh, the construction of an urban cross section. Uh, to answer uh, the traffic impact analysis, the request for that is being um, asked of the developer due to the amount of trips within the, the multiple phases. And we would look for intersection improvements and connectivity. Um, with the connectivity through the site at this location, our goal is to uh, have pedestrians cross not at the East Hamilton intersection and Gateway intersection, but go through the site and, and cross to the trail more at the driveway to uh, um, not have as many conflicts with traffic when they're crossing is our hope. So I have a follow-up question. Yes. Uh, I guess related to sidewalks, there's also the, there's really no, um, connection from the proposed public sidewalk or the one recommended by staff between the, the two most southern driveways on Gateway. Um, there's no real pedestrian connection through the, like to the buildings um, from that public sidewalk. So I was wondering if it would be possible at least to add a sidewalks to the, like along the edge of the driveways. Would that be something that would be possible? Yes, uh, that would just be added a condition. Um, the applicant is here as well to address that potentially. I did want to also clarify the second phase as shown on this site plan. Uh, that would have to come back to this plan commission for review uh, at a later date when the applicant is ready for that to be under construction. That would have to be approved as a separate site plan at a later date. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Is the applicant here? Welcome back. Good evening. Again, Sean Bohan, 1504 Sherwin Avenue, um, uh, here representing the developer. Um, a question in regards to um, pedestrian access, I guess, out to um, Gateway. We are looking. Um, at putting a connection from the two different types of, um, of buildings. Um, we do end up having striping that falls within the, the, uh, the paved areas that connect the west side and the east side. Um, we are going to put a sidewalk that actually takes them out to Gateway Drive. Um, so that basically takes care of that whole inner area, being able to access and get out to Gateway. Um, and then like Ms. Ness and, and Mr. Petrie ended up stating, then we're going to end up also doing the connection between this, the first and the second driveway, we'll end up having sidewalk, and then we will end up crossing, um, you know, Gateway Drive at that point to uh, to the west. So, um, other than that, I'm here to answer any other questions that you may have. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion from the commission to? Uh, um, approve this uh, site plan. Commissioner Seymour. Thank you. I'll move approval with staff recommendations. Is there a second? Commissioner Christofferson. I'll second. All right. Any discussion? Commissioner Wolfgram. So thank you, Chairperson Larson. I will be voting yes. However, I remain concerned and I've prepared some comments about the lack of a jobs housing fit. When a development comes in front of us, I've talked about this before. I would just appreciate your patience having a few minutes to share what is a mounting concern. In our city on September 19th, 2019, when the Gateway One apartments were asking for site plan approval, 
I registered my concern that this site is in a very high density, low wage area. Retail workers and service related occupational workers who make up part of the 37% of our workforce in Eau Claire who earn from 20 to $28,000 per year, which is 40 to less than 60% of the average median income, and that hovers at approximately $50,000 a year. At that time, for the Gateway One Apartments, the developer was targeting the 80 to 120% of the area median income market, those making 40 to $60,000 a, a year, again, in this area, where a vast number of the workers are earning between twenty dollars to $28,000 a year. Rents at that time were quoted at $700 for a one-bedroom, one-bath, and $1,100 for a two-bedroom. I drove by this weekend, and rents for Gateway One were advertised on the sign at $895 for a one-bedroom, one-bath. Someone who's making $20,000 a year, which is 40% of the average median income, can afford approximately $514 for a one bedroom, including utilities, if you're making $28,000, which is just under 60% of the AMI. They can afford a rent of close to $700. These apartments starting at $895 for a one bedroom, one bath are out of the reach of the workers in this area. When I read the narrative for Gateway 2, it appears that the rents will be consistent, if not higher, because of the parking amenity. Now we have another very large complex, 146 apartments between the two phases that will not meet the needs of our workforce in that area. A jobs housing fit framework is working with developers to build housing that matches the needs of the people that work in that area. The virtues of a fit are obvious and intuitive. If housing is available and affordable for all re residents in a particular area, Households at all income levels will have a stable place to call home, leading to increased job security. It's good for business, higher community engagement, shorter commutes, and reduced greenhouse gas footprints, a generally increased quality of life. Conversely, if we build for only the highest income levels in a particular area that does not fit those that work in the area, we end up creating economic segregation, which is detrimental to our region as a whole. Yes, we do need to build, and the Chippewa Valley Affordable Housing Task Force recommendations state that, quote unquote, housing supply in the Chippewa Valley is insufficient to meet current need and demand in every income category and housing type. However, the second sentence is that, quote unquote, the most acute need is for quality rental housing that is affordable for persons of low income. This idea that the more market rate high-end housing we build trickles down and opens up more affordable units as people move up is not really the reality on the ground for most people working low-wage jobs and many of them piecing together two to three part-time jobs. Their income is less likely to increase for them to move up. My hope is that as we move forward, we keep a, jo a job housing fit framework on the front end and work with developers to offer even a small percent of their units dedicated to meeting the need of the workforce in which their development resides. This may require developer incentives. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other discussion? Commissioner Christofferson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I did not ask this as a question, but I, I would put it out there in case there is a response. But in uh, reading the renewable energy, what does REAP stand for, action plan. One of the short-term uh, emphasis is the idea that the residential areas really are contributing a high amount of uh, carbon footprint. And the way that the city is responding to that is placing residential close to uh, transportation or close to their employment locations. Uh, making sure that it's uh, accessible to public transit, um, making sure that there's um, appropriate green practices. So within that framework, I'm, I'm just wondering how uh, creative and thoughtful this development is in helping the city to meet its goals for renewable energy. And you may respond or not respond. That would be my statement. Okay. Um, all right. 
Any, uh, Commissioner Gregor? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, you know, I do have some concerns that you know I've been. I share some of the concerns that have been raised by um, my fellow commissioners here, um, but I do, in light of trying to make this development a little bit better, <laughs> I, I do have a. Would like to make a motion um, to add a condition, essentially, to the letter. Um, and obviously, I appreciate the staff recommendation to that is included with this to have the extra sidewalk on Gateway that connects the two driveways. But I'd also like to, in this motion, add a um, a, a condition that sidewalks. Um, be constructed between the public sidewalk and the development via the driveways, all three of them actually, on the gateway side. Um, and staff can certainly, as my understanding, could work with the developer on the exact placement of those, but that would be my motion. All right, is there a second? I'll second. Commissioner Wolfgram. Any discussion on that motion to amend? Commissioner Seymour. Thank you. Uh, could you maybe reword that or clarify exactly what, what the amendment is, please? Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so I, you know, there will be, um, sidewalk constructed under the, the current motion in front of us along Gateway Drive from the, the driveway that's furthest to the south all the way to the driveway furthest to the north. So there's three driveways. And my um, motion would be to add a condition that there be a sidewalk connection from the public sidewalk to the um, to at least the first building like of the development so that people wouldn't have to walk down the driveway to between the street and the the development just because there's a lot of traffic in those particular areas and um, on driveways in particular and so it offers an alternative If somebody could maybe show me on the site plan, um, maybe Ryan. Okay, my understanding is uh, the applicant is showing it right now. Um, what Mr. Grigger is talking about is adding a sidewalk connection from here to at least the first building, again here to the first building, and again from here to the first building. That would get the, the people living in the, uh, walking within the neighborhood to at least the first building within the development. Is that my understanding? Yeah, thank you. And I. I mean, I, I think the site plan has other issues that that cause it. That's about the best we can do at this point. So, okay. Does any, uh, I think I'd be interested in hearing from the applicant on their input on that. Anybody else interested in that? I knew you'd get me up here. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve Wiggins, I live at 3560 Sharon Drive. So obviously we drew that on there because we were understanding what you were saying and we're agreeable to that. So that makes sense. So okay, thank you. Okay. Any any questions on uh, on this amendment for the applicant? All right, thank you. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, I'll call the question to the to amend the uh, approval to include those two sections of sidewalk. Those three, I'm sorry, sections of sidewalk. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Any opposed? All right. So we have before us the um, the site plan as amended. Any discussion on that? Commissioner Peterson. Can we go back to the sidewalks? Didn't you include a sidewalk in between the, the first two driveways also, parallel to Gateway Drive? I would just say answer that. That was uh, included with the original motion because it was part of the staff recommendation okay. in the okay. original letter. Because that would make four total sidewalks then. Okay. If I may, Mr. Chair, I don't know if uh, the applicant would like to respond to Commissioner Christofferson's question about the uh, yes. renewable energy or the uh, aspects related to that. Go ahead. No, I'm deferring to the to you, Mr. Chair. To, if that's a question for the applicant, if that question is not yeah, it wasn't answered. it wasn't clear to me. Do you want a response? I I simply said they may respond if they have a response but okay. it's my statement having read that that that's the direction that the plan commission will be talking about so so okay thank I you do, i, I do not you. have a response i would defer to the applicant if they had any kind of uh i guess uh energy aspirations with their development i suppose okay do you have any comments from the applicant Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion before we go to a vote? I see none. So we'll call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Congratulations. Um, next on the agenda is a update on the draft renewable energy action plan and I would like to recognize at this time our two commission members who participated in a 40 member committee steering committee that helped develop this plan Commissioner uh, Granlund and Commissioner Obeyed participated in that process thanks for your for your work yes thank you lots of hard work so we're here today after a year of lots of great work with three products, actually four products that have been noted in your memo um, called the Renewable Energy Action Plan. And so um, this, is, this is pretty uh, exciting for the city. We have not done a plan like this before. This is uh, driven by the city council's 100% renewable energy action goal and carbon neutrality goal set in March of 2018. So that set forth a need to plan to understand what this is we're going to require to meet these lofty, ambitious goals by 2050. And the plan, with all of the work, we've actually found that we're well on our way. So that's encouraging. Um, so just to get started, and I've hyperlinked the plan, too, so we can go back to uh, particular strategies if you want to get into those nuances. But we're really looking for you today to, if you feel comfortable, to set forth the public hearing for February 17th. Uh, the, the public hearing for the Sustainability Advisory Committee is the February 18th. They, they feel comfortable where things are at. Uh, this project's in their work plan for the, for the year, and so they've set forth that uh, public hearing then. Uh, but we also need your direction if, we, if you'd like to set a public hearing up for the next meeting. So with that, uh, so we, yeah, back to this. We, have, we try to do a lot of branding with this to keep, keep a consistent image. And so we had additional funds through our grant from the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin to hire a graphic artist to do some of these nice, nice packaging and um, consistent looks. We also did a four-pager executive summary, which boils all of this down into like a practical way for the public can actually take the plan and say, well, what does this mean to me? You can use a four-page guide to look at actions you can do from kind of easy wins all the way down to stretch, stretch actions and challenge actions and then how that all kind of comes together on the fourth page to look at how all those collective actions in a community could actually meet the goals. And the interim goal that the city council set is 30% reduction carbon dioxide equivalents which includes methane and nitrous oxide by 2030. 
So again, I had mentioned that the city council set these goals, that interim goals at 30% drop from our baseline, which is 2015. 2015 was the first year that we actually had enough data to reliably say that we know our carbon footprint for the whole community. The city's been tracking ours uh, since 2011. We've been able to do that because we have more direct control on our purchases. So they set forth this, um, this, these goals and then we have the plan. We also asked the public, you know, what do you think about these goals? And by and large, 75% felt like the city should set forward strong uh, carbon goals, strong renewable energy action goals. This was done prior to the city council actually adopting those goals. So that this gave them more confidence to say, okay, the public's behind us. Also, we understand that Wisconsin's, our climate is changing. Uh, just from 1960 to 2010, those years we have seen a 2.5 degree Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit increase, which if you think about our own body temperature, when you hit uh, 100.4, it's a fever. <laughs> so not too much and you know things can, can uh, cause concern. So we're already starting to see that with some of our ecosystems um, and also some different vector-borne illnesses like more tick increases as well. Uh, the modeling, and no one actually knows, but by 2100, what our, our climate would look like, uh, a worst case scenario could be like Topeka, Kansas. So again, nobody really knows, but just if emissions like business as usual stay that course, we could, can, we could warm an additional um, uh, 3.6 degrees over the next 60 years and then 2.7 over the next 30 years after that. So again, those are modeling, but we're already seeing impacts when it comes to just looking the trend lines at multi-billion dollar disasters. And again, the committee, this REAP committee, looked at a lot of this education on the front end before they got into the actual plan. But can we actually attribute any one particular event to climate change? Not necessarily. But we can look at the trends. And over time, we see that there's more extreme weather causing or occurring. And we know that a part of that is to do to a warming climate more energy require, uh, produces more, more violent um, weather. And so back to this grant, you know, with the goals, we have the Renewable Energy Action Plan, which is the master plan. So it, when it comes to your decision to adopt it, it will actually be a component of the comprehensive plan, much like your bicycle pedestrian advisory um, plan and other plans like that. We also have other feeder plans that go into that. We have the Net Zero Energy Building Guide, which is basically how a building can um, produce energy with solar or geothermal so that it equals its actual consumption load. And then we have electric vehicle roadmap, which is looking at transportation and try to electrify that so that it's more um, using more renewable energy. And then something that you have not seen is the facility condition assessment. That's an internal document to look at over 600,000 600, square feet of our buildings and how we actually can do more renewable energy and energy efficiency. And so we just got that report back from our consultant and that will help us with our energy efficiency goal. Um, and that will be updated in the plan when you see it for your public hearing. Uh, for example, we have uh, with lighting retrofits, we, we can see probably a 7% uh, energy reduction over the whole city's lighting um, budget right now. So. Getting into the, the actual plan, so the, the master plan is the, the Renewable Energy Action Plan. It's an energy plan and it's a climate plan. It's two in one. And it has these different five sectors. You get the buildings in residential, commercial, and industry. You've got the transportation sector. You've got waste and then biodiversity. And biodiversity is dealing with our parks, um, our trees, uh, anything that's basically green space uh, within the city. Uh, we had mentioned the, the robust public steering committee and uh, just to look at the representation in terms of uh, their influence on the community, we have, we have a lot of cross connections between businesses, small business, business associations, industry, Cascade for example, uh, one of the largest energy users in the city was on the committee, um, medical institutions, service providers, nonprofits, energy utilities, City departments were well represented, colleges, school district, congregations, local clubs, and neighborhoods. 
So what's their background? We, we did a, a pre-survey before we actually did our first workshop, and most of them have a good awareness of energy issues. Most of them have a good awareness of climate change literacy. We also wanted to team up with a, a, one of the leaders in the nation who are very fortunate to have Excel Energy as our service provider, our main service provider. They, they probably pr provide maybe 95, 99% of all of our energy use. Um, Eau Claire Energy Cooperative is also a great partner. They provide a little less. They, the biggest use that they have is Fleet Farm. So they, they work with communities in Colorado and Minnesota, and we're the first Wisconsin community, and we wanted to work with them because we know that they have a lot of expertise. So this is their team, their facilitators, and their Excel Energy staff, local, and also out of corporate Minneapolis. Why do we want to work with them is because the lion's share of our first decade um, um, progress is going to be through the, the, electrific or the, the um, decarbonization of the, the grid. So our grid is getting cleaner and cleaner with renewables. And what they propose to do is 20, well right now it's 29% renewable energy that you can, you can say is coming from, from that light. And uh, by 2020, 46% as they bring on new wind farms. And by 2030, they project in the upper Midwest service territory a 60% renewable energy. So that's pretty amazing. Um, that's gonna be mostly all electricity. So we asked the steering committee to come up with a vision, and um, you know this is a nice graphic that we came up with with our graphic artist, kind of that renewable, sustainable city, and uh, calling out some different iconic buildings within the city. And so they wanted to be evidence-based, you know, the science, transparent, equitable, inclusive, to meet the goals. They also wanted the efforts to strengthen our leadership in sustainability space and the renewable energy development for generations to come. So not only what we're doing now, but for future generations. They also uh, looked at three, or, um, the natural step system conditions, which is something that the city council passed over a decade ago. And they boiled that down to three um, principles. So equity inclusiveness, that they're gonna engage the whole community as we go forth and implement the strategies. That we, uh, we seek to do economic development, so clean energy jobs and such economic stewardship that we preserve and protect what we've got and grow that for generations to come. We also wanted to engage the public in a different way and so we commissioned a, a muralist to uh, devise this, this display at Haymarket Plaza. The weather was horrible though unfortunately so we didn't have a lot of people out there. Um, but my son's up there putting down his little thought and uh, it was just a great way to teach him some important things in life too. So the steering committee uh, we really worked them uh, pretty hard with surveys and homework, reading materials, and we asked them to, to rank different strategies, to put them in a matrix in terms of like forget about it, to you know high priority, high impact, let's just do it, to tactics and how can we actually get the action behind these strategies, to looking at forces against those tactics. For example, you know if you wanted to require a building to be solar, well, you can't do that because a force against that, the state doesn't allow it. So we had to set forth those parameters in terms of what to work in. So the plan, getting in more to the meat now, uh, they came up with five sections and one cross-cutting goal. These were laid out, as you've, if you've seen the plan, in um, near-term strategies, which is basically a 10-year outlook to meet that 30% carbon reduction goal. Each strategy has a goal and then a, a metric to, to evaluate that goal. And then also they boil, they all fold up into critical pathways, and I'll demonstrate what these are. Then um, those pathways were modeled to, to look at the carbon neutral goal, which we can show that we, instead of 30%, we predict we can beat it and we can be at 36%. We also looked at renewable energy goal and where we're at currently and where we're gonna be in, tw in 10 years. The implementation strategy or uh, work plan will basically inform work plans for this body, for the sustainability advisory body, for the bike and pedestrian body, the city council, and so forth. The tactics is a really, in some ways, repetition of everything that we just talked about here in those previous sections, but they get into more the actions behind um, the milestones and the actual strategies, kind of more the, the, the tasks, the to-dos and then the long-term initiatives, those are things that are 
that we might not have enough um, understanding yet or uh, the price might be too high or the science is not there or the technology is not there but we we think that that might be coming down the pike 10 years out so I'm just going to walk through one example in the residential um, so in the residential section on page 24 we have renewable energy pathway so we would like to see per year 200 households to go all renewable electricity so all your kwh and your household bill would be renewable that might be solar uh, on the on the rooftop or you might subscribe to a utility program like renewable connect through excel it's up to the the homeowner or the renter and so we actually assign value weight of um, 1.7 million kilowatt hours per year so we can total this up how that's then laid out with uh, the strategy R8 is to increase private owner uh, solar. So we look at a goal of 50 new systems per year, which would equal that amount of kilowatt hours per year. With And we can track this by our number of permits, our building permits. Easy to track. We, on page 45, we, uh, the implementation plan, these are, again, more the milestones we say we uh, would like to promote the city's solar guide which is included in your memo and also our pv calculators and our pv website in the first year easy things to do detailed tactics then at, in page 62 we get into the audiences the who and the what uh, the general public in this case um, and what we have here is to keep the permit fees low which they are currently and the zoning favorable which they are 2016 you passed a nice solar ordinance so any questions with that before I get into the the carbon and the new re renewables and then we can open up to questions okay so here's how we're doing we're not doing very great right now <laughs> uh, 2015 that's our baseline year um, with and there's lag time to measure all this data it's a lot of data um, 2018 you know we basically have gone up a smidge uh, when we look at growth, which is a 1% growth rate amongst all sectors, so again, it's an assumption, but you can see business as usual would put us on that trend line going up. And with all those critical pathways, renewable energy, energy efficiency, transportation reduction, and vehicle miles traveled and such, we end up with that 36% reduction. Again, it's hypothetical, but if everything works out the way we hope, we would get there. Renewable energy is not as, as strong. Right now we're at 6% total um, for the community and a main issue of that is how much gasoline, di gasoline and diesel is being driven by our, by our vehicles. So um, when you aggregate all the, the mil million BTUs, Brit British thermal units, we're only at 6% of uh, renewable energy. By 2030 we'd be at 16%. And mo most of that is gonna be coming again on that uh, decarbonization of the grid so as more vehicles we assume 8,000 vehicles by 2030 will be electric with that running on 60% renewable energy that helps us to get to that 16% so the sub plans that fold underneath the renewable action plan we have the net zero energy guide this is the first in our state actually so we have big cities like Milwaukee and Madison very eager to see what we're doing with this what we've done here highlighted is the the three main goals that the steering committee came up with we plugged them right into these sub action plans and so you can see that R1 promote the use of the city's net zero energy building guide again this can't be a mandate because the state code does not allow us to go that way but we want to promote it, we want to educate, we want to train our architects and builders, uh, which we'll do in the spring. Um, by 2030, so three a year, three homes a year, net zero energy. That's still pretty ambitious, but that's the goal. Um, and then one residential subdivision, it could have been the one that we just talked about. For example, that gentleman, he had his buildings not facing the correct way to actually take advantage of solar they would have been east-west facing, you could have got that southern exposure. So just an example there. And we want to try to help educate our builders to say, well, you've got a site. Well, how can you maximize it so that you can meet these goals? Sometimes they're thinking about it, sometimes they're not. Um, so this guide helps them to think about it. And then uh, 10 commercial buildings by 2030, so one a year. The EV roadmap. 
this is details electrification of our not only our um, community but also our municipal fleet so as staff got together uh, our mechanics our fleet um, supervisors we said we'd like to actually have a 15 percent goal which basically means about 55 vehicles that we would have electrified by 2030. Um, the, the public goal that was stated by the REAP steering committee was 10 percent so that's roughly 8,000 vehicles registered vehicles by 2030 sounds like a lot um, and also we looked at the infrastructure that's needed and we saw that a 1 to 50 ratio one charger per 50 vehicles in the public would mean 160 charging stations this does not necessarily mean that it's the city paying for all those stations it could be workplace charging it could be could be um, if you've seen the electrify america charging stations over at walmart those count so that's that and these are some graphs that just show the municipal 15 ev fleet roughly about 55 by by the decade end and then 10 percent of the vehicle miles traveled electrified 8,000 evs by 2030 and um, these trends or these goals are not actually on par with national trends they're actually lower and we've accounted for that partly because we're a northern climate where Southern California and other places um, you know there's no degradation to the battery life when when you have colder vehicles so with that open up to questions suggestions recommendations again if you're interested in moving to the next step the public hearing on the 17th um, and I note here the Sustainability Advisory Committee on the 18th public hearing and then if all those things move forward the City Council would vote or have their public hearing on the 24th and then the vote on the 25th so I know this is a lot of information um, but let's just open it up to questions and comments thank you Mr. Peterson when I read through this as I was getting into into the future it sounded like there was going to be actions by the City Council on requirements yeah certain ones mm -hmm. um, yeah is there anyone in particular think no but just okay. in general and but they have to be um, allowed by the state correct right mm -hmm. okay um, you also talked about interacting with inter intergovernmental boundary agreements etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. is Altoona Lake Halley, Chippewa Falls, and the surrounding towns doing the same thing, or? Well, the county has the same goals as the city. The school district has the same goals as the city. Um, I, I understand Altoona has been thinking about passing some similar goals as well. So there's, there's starting to be good alignment there. The, the towns would be covered by the county. Okay, because I, you know, this is a lofty and I think an, cool. a desirable goal. But one of the things I was thinking of, if, if we, the city, pass some uh, requirements further on in this stage and the surrounding communities do not, that's probably going to push a lot of these people out, which means they're going to be commuting and it's going to be counterproductive to what we're trying to do. So we have to be very careful there and I, I would very much like to, if the county is looking at doing this too, maybe they can be the catalyst to bring the surrounding communities into the fold also it's mm -hmm. so. a very good point mm -hmm. unintended consequences and I think that because we have the same goals that's going to help where we have common language to begin with and to say you know what areas do we preserve for ag preservation or biodiversity habitat which areas do we need to densify in the city make it more affordable housing and things like that so Is there there was many aspects in which Madison got very very strict in some of them not not necessarily in this area and they have a three mile extraterritorial boundary where we have a mile and a half all the development took place outside the three miles where they couldn't touch them mm -hmm. and I'm afraid the same thing could happen here if we don't bring the enveloping towns into the, the picture mm -hmm. also yeah that's a good point thank you mm -hmm. Mr. Christofferson thank you this was compelling reading so this is a, a a process question it's going to sound a little flaky but I'll I'll take responsibility for that um, when you this looks like such a typical institutional put it pushing out 
where um, you have that token public hearing and then you vote on it and then people in the neighborhood say, oh, the city, you know, they made this decision, now they're forcing it down our throat. And I, and I know that that's not our intention, but it's still, that's people's experience. So the only, I would just ask this for discussion is, it would be interesting for um, public groups to almost have like a, a book group where you could sit with the facilitated read of, mm -hmm. of whatever you can digest or maybe in um, sections of this. So people, as I read this, just because it was on my reading list for tonight, I, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have gone on the website and just went, oh, 100, 100 pages of great reading. But I, I, I really learned a lot, and I, I began thinking about my house, my uh, planned investments, how, um, how strongly do I want to be seen as a participant, what's, what's achievable for me personally. So it, it made a difference that I had this opportunity to really absorb it. But it would also help other individuals to get buy-in before, buy before they saw that the council has voted on it. So I, I know that that means that there would be some lag, but all of the work has been done. It's, it's really an effective, um, achievable plan. So I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. going to say, this, this is the way the city usually does stuff. And maybe we could just take a breath and see, could we be really um, interested in having our consumers, our citizens, our residents consume it a bit mm -hmm. and see how, how, do they, um, how do they participate before they see city government mm -hmm. or city leaders voting it in? Yeah, one, one um, process uh, point is that this plan is um, tied to grant funding, and so we have, we've already asked for an extension on it, a six-month extension, so we, we don't have a lot of time left to do additional like public open houses and things like that, but that, your point is well taken about how, how to make this consumable to the average public, and, and we try to have some little um, vignette stories in the plan of, of you know, how low income used a weatherization program. Um, you know, how a big factory was able to save a lot of money and energy with their, with their paper process. But really, we distilled it down to this four page summary that, you know, there's not a lot, you know, if you want to get nerdy, you can go to the last page. But the, the first, you know, three pages are pretty straightforward and they make it very practical for anybody to pick up to say, okay, you know, yeah, maybe I should consolidate a few trips, you know, so I don't have to drive all around town. Maybe I'll just, you know, save one of those errands on, and do both on Saturday. You know, just some easy wins there that people can start to feel empowered. The whole thing about this is that we never wanted to come at and penalize people and to say, you need to do this and we're gonna slap you, you know, with this fine if you have your windows open. You know, other cities have done that and we know that that's not the right way. We wanna educate and empower, help people to feel confident. We're all a part of this. You know, so how do, how do we move you know, with our value system as a community so that we can actually do these things one bit at a time. Some of them are very difficult, but other things you can do together. And I think as you build critical momentum and mass, we can, we can achieve more. So to your point about how to actually roll this out to the community is we've applied for an Eau Claire Community Foundation grant. We hope to get this where we would have um, low, well, we don't, we could call it this, but um, low carbon diet teams, so like the biggest loser for your carbon um, CO2, lose 5,000 pounds, you know, of CO2 in 60 days. So we'll see how that goes if we can get the funding, but it's basically a campaign that you work together in your neighborhood, uh, you know, your, um, sc your school, your workplace, um, your faith-based community, you create a team. And this was done like about 10 years ago with our eco teams. And I don't know if any of you remember with, uh, with Jonah, they were the spearheaded with that. And you work together on sustainability actions. And it's the same thing with this low carbon diet teams. And then what we're thinking about with the sustainability advisory committee, you know, you do some of these actions like this, you, you, you score the points of how many CO2 pounds you've actually lost. It's all, it's all measured. And then the winners, they get a prize at the end. We have our annual sustainability advisory committee awards and they're nice, these nice, handsome 
uh, reused tree uh, plaques that we give out to the community that are doing well, and they could potentially win those prizes. So try to incentivize, gamify it a little bit, um, help people to feel educated and empowered rather than say, you know, let's do enforcement and ordinances right away. So we hope that that might help. A lot of it, our Sustainability Advisory Committee really wants to educate and market. Um, go that route the first year, lay a solid foundation before we get into, you know, ordinances and things like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson? In that same vein, getting the word out there and getting some buy-in, we do have the neighborhood associations, mm -hmm. which I think is a good news to start, um, in that the school board has bought into this. We have the PTAs. Unfortunately, my kids are no longer in school, no PTA. I have no neighborhood association. But I think when water bills are mailed out, that gets mailed out to every building in the city that something of this information could be included in that. You know, where it'd be a printing cost and envelope stuffing, but Ryan can do that. You can do that. Scott or I'll if come we get in, that I'll grant, come, maybe I'll we come can, in and yeah. do it. So mm -hmm. just way to get the word out there. Great. Good ideas. Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Noel and fellow um, commissioners to my left and right who were involved with this too. Um, I guess I, yeah, I wanted to add a little bit more flavor maybe to answer some of the questions from my fellow commissioners too. I, one of the ways that I think this, um, this plan like can be something that um, isn't just about Eau Claire and, and maybe avoid some of the um, some of the issues that Commissioner Peterson brought up with regard to those boundaries is that I think, um, you know, the governor, uh, Tony Evers, has made a, um, a similar type of commitment for the state through executive order. And obviously there's a limit to what that means, but um, it's to be 100%, uh, to have 100% carbon free energy by uh, 2050. And um, that is a little different in the, at its carbon free versus renewable and then his focus was actually more on electricity versus the entire picture um, of greenhouse gas emissions. But I think that's an important thing. And, and as Mr. Noel mentioned, there's also XL Energy. Um, as a partner, they, they've made a 100% um, carbon-free electricity commitment um, by 2050. So both of those things, I think, are very significant to try to um, have Eau Claire not just be a little island in all of this, but also I think it shows that Eau Claire has really been able to push like state and um, utility decision making on this, this important issue. So um, just w wanted to mention that. And um, I guess to the point of education, I th that's obviously going to be a huge piece. And I think this is going to be a really good document to help um, and use for book clubs or you know, in different forms, as, as Mr. Noel mentioned with the grant too. And there are, there have been a lot of book clubs that I've actually participated in related to sustainability and the natural step we did, um, natural step for communities like more than 10 years ago. And that really kind of brought us to the point of, of uh, doing, you know, the sustainability chapter uh, in the comprehensive plan. And we've done them through transition towns. There's the, um, and that and often the public library and I think actually all cases the public library part of the city um, has really been like a key partner in that so I expect that to continue as well um, to have the library uh, uh, as a partner in all of this so just wanted to mention those few things too thank you any more questions from the Commission Commissioners uh, Granlin and Obeyed, anything you want to add? Okay. That's fine. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I was just going to say it was exciting to be a part of it. Um, and the plan is, you know, <laughs> robust and detailed and really great. Um, but I think the biggest things will be engaging people, you know, implementation 
partnerships and, and education and making everybody kind of own it in a sense because nothing will happen if we don't do that. So. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Christofferson. I, I would like to just piggyback on all of a sudden I had this other expanded <laughs> thought is when you have this diet team and you begin to look at ways of, of really engaging not only for information but literally for engaging them in some commitment it would be interesting if our goal was always looking for who is that volunteer in the block in the neighborhood at the mm -hmm. library always recruiting yet another person that's going to be responsible for signing up their neighbor or it, I, I just think we really need to be intentional and focused on continual recruitment of people that are willing to to say yes mm -hmm. thank you mr. Peterson when information is sent out to the general public um, being an engineer I've had a couple of science courses some of the metrics in here mm -hmm. made my head swim so I think we have to keep it very, very simple out there, mm -hmm. you know, so that John Q. public can understand it and, and buy into it. Otherwise, their heads are going to be swimming too, and say, I'm going to leave this to the experts. Yeah, that's a very good point, and, and uh, it's, it's hard to keep it all straight. And one of the things that, uh, it's hard to see it up there right now, but there's a little air, hot air balloon. And the reason why we chose that was that the volume of air within that hot air balloon is one metric ton of CO2. And so if you can just use simple objects and sim simple things to convey what this kind of scientific stuff means, you know, um, I think that helps the people to see, well, imagine nine, 900,000 hot air balloons above the city. It's a lot. That's our, that's our carbon footprint. Mr. Greger. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Noel, the issue of this coming in front of the Plan Commission and then, and also Sustainability Advisory Commission again and then City Council, mm -hmm. so there's kind of three points of public hearing. And what exactly is, are each of those bodies going to be doing in terms of what is the level of approval? Is it essentially accepting the, the documents or are you? Um, in terms of like if we have ideas for like a change, how would you like to see that expressed? Um, right. Uh, well, any, any changes besides just grammar and small things like that, we can always do it after final approvals. But um, any major significant comments and things like that, I would like to have them sooner than later. I think by the February 12th, we need to have things pretty buttoned up for, for if you would direct tonight for a public hearing on the 17th. So the 12th would be we really really the Friday before the 12th um, is a key uh, so that we have time to, to make changes. And uh, each one of these bodies uh, need to approve it because it would be adopted as part of the comprehensive plan. So it would be impacts land use, decisions that you, you'll make. You, a, lot of, a lot of the things will come before you. Um, so you'll, you'll have to find consistency with the comp plan. We've, we've done that work for you already. It's consistent. Um, it, it expands the comp plan, <laughs> definitely. But um, so each, each body has to approve of it. Um, ultimately, city council has to approve it. A quick follow-up to that. Um, so if there are, in light of the fact that we'll have three public hearings, and if there are ideas from the public that come after that, um, you mentioned like the February 11th or so, like procedurally to change that, to make any changes, it would be just amending it on the, on the floor of those meetings. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hopefully letting you know ahead of time. Yeah, that's always <laughs> helpful. Yeah. It's a big document. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. I have just a couple of questions and maybe a comment. Um, so you are looking for some feedback from the commission as far as February 17th? Correct, or, if, or you, if you would, uh, if you feel comfortable to set the public hearing. Okay. Still gives you a chance to re uh, review it again and, and provide more comment and bring up amendments at the meeting uh, if need be, but 
okay. looking for that direction tonight. Let me just ask the commission if there's any objection to the 17th for a public hearing. Okay. Looks like we have okay. a consensus on that. Um, what, I, I have a question about the committee meetings. Was there members of the media that regularly came to the committee? Or are they kind of up to speed on... Right. <laughs> we always invited them. We, you know, public yeah, notice, know. they're always invited. Um, I think we had a couple stories really more keyed in on electric vehicles. So there was at least two stories there. Uh, there was a, a newspaper article uh, Andrew Dowd had, had written on clean energy, kind of the status of where this plan's at. Um, but yeah, we were, we were hoping for some more um, like kind of in-person engagement at the workshops to show how the you know, we had this great steering committee that was there that um, all these voices of our community. So we didn't have as much as we thought. Uh, you mentioned some sort of, uh, I think you called it gamifying mm -hmm. <laughs> some of our goals or uh, some sort of competitive uh, public interest activity that um, I, I just personally might suggest, I think the people at volume one have a really creative so they have some really creative minds over there for that kind of thing and they they do the annual voting for best restaurant and best hamburger and favorite mm -hmm. electorate of elected official <laughs> and that kind of stuff so i'm just curious if they uh, it seems like a topic they might be interested in maybe they could find mm -hmm. some creative creative way to to keep it in front of the public mm -hmm. yeah we have others that have, that have um, offered their their free help on that too. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of, well, not, I, I don't know about a lot, but there's people that are interested in helping to see this through, whether it's, you know, pro bono or mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so I understand this will be like a chapter of the comprehensive plan and an added chapter to the plan. Uh, it would be like your bicycle pedestrian plan. That it, okay. it's not a chapter per se, but it's its own plan that has the authority and the weight of the comp plan. Well, thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. My pleasure. Good presentation. Thanks for your work. Mm -hmm. uh, and an affordable housing update from Mr. Allen. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Commission members. Uh, don't have a thorough or detailed uh, presentation like Mr. Noella had. Um, it's just a a quick update uh, from the last time we had a conversation about uh, affordable housing, uh, particularly as it related to the Chippewa Valley Regional Housing Task Force and the work that the uh, City of Eau Claire has been doing as a result of that. Uh, the last time I gave an update was just uh, back in November. Uh, it's hard to believe that's already been uh, three months ago. So if I'm doing my math right. So uh, about three months ago. But uh, just a quick kind of summary to get us kind of uh, framing the uh, update here real briefly. Uh, the task force through that regional effort really kicked off uh, the summer of 2018, so a little over 18 months ago, and uh, really was trying to build this collaborative conversation around uh, affordable housing, around housing challenges looking at solutions and uh, again just facilitating some additional conversations <clears throat> excuse me with that uh, the task force met uh, over six different meetings uh, put together their uh, consensus statements which were then uh, expanded into recommendations and then uh, a final uh, more formal report uh, the final report and summary of recommendations were then accepted by, kind of received by uh, the city council also back in November. So after I gave an update to the planning commission, it was the beginning of November, uh, the following meeting actually, the following week, the city council uh, kind of heard and discussed and then received those uh, recommendations and reports. Uh, along with this, uh, the task force established four sector based kind of sector groups or subgroups. Uh, centered around building and development, finance, zoning and policy, and lived experience and service providers. And those sector groups also met. Uh, we had a couple meetings of a few of those groups 
uh, in November as well. Uh, December was uh, working on a number of other items uh, more specific to uh, the City of Eau Claire. Uh, those included working on this new commission as well as looking at uh, kind of this affordable housing fund, for lack of a better term, uh, that was uh, appropriated by the city council and essentially uh, activated here uh, the first of the year with the new budget. <coughs> so with that, uh, kind of bouncing back to city of Altoona, again, a key partner in this uh, regional effort uh, their city council formally adopted their own Altoona Housing Action Plan last May. Uh, they identified the Plan Commission there to be essentially the keepers, implementers of that action plan. Uh, in this case, uh, City of Eau Claire and through the city council uh, just last week uh, adopted an ordinance creating a new Housing Opportunities Commission. Uh, you may ask why the name Housing Opportunities Commission uh, obviously always looking to be uh, kind of forward-thinking and positive in that uh, nomenclature and so really wanted to identify the fact that this Commission is really looking at identifying and promoting uh, housing opportunities uh, throughout the city and the community and the region as a whole uh, eventually uh, again that also is trying to differentiate it from some of the existing uh, boards and commissions. So for example, there's the Housing Authority Board and wanted to make sure it was clearly distinguished. It's not related or connected to that group. Uh, there's a Housing Advisory Board, which is also different. And so again, not to get into all the, the weeds, but those are the types of things that were under discussion. Uh, Council members Worthman and Beaton were uh, kind of leading the charge with this um, this ordinance uh, working with me and other staff to put the kind of the the fine-tuning and final touches on it before it went to council again last week there are a few amendments that were offered and incorporated into the Commission I believe everyone was given a final version of that it's just over two pages long I was emailed out uh, by Angie on Friday um, I don't know Mr. Petrie knows we have some paper copies we may have if folks would like those as well or maybe even actually thank you thank you even better uh, handed out ahead of the meeting so uh, I don't don't want to go line by line but if there's any questions or comments on that certainly let me know I did want to highlight a few of these uh, specifics of this Commission uh, and then I'll I'll talk a little bit about next steps and then uh, you know, take any kind of feedback or conversation from there uh, the definition of affordable housing uh, if you are part of or were observing the regional housing task force over the last 18 months you know that was a uh, a larger issue than we perhaps anticipated getting into the discussion uh, defining what affordable housing means is always uh, a complicated issue uh, but in this case just trying to really uh, boil it down and be reflective uh, more specifically to the work of the Housing Task Force and it talks to uh, referring to housing units and their related expenses uh, that cost no more than 30 percent of the average median gross annual income of a resident of Eau Claire to rent or finance utilizing prevailing home mortgage lending practices you know a little bit of legalese thrown in there but uh, again trying to incorporate all the related expenses uh, for renting or owning a home uh, the uh, some specifics in terms of their purpose and intent the last item was added by your own Commission member uh, Council member Christofferson added item number E at the top of the second page uh, talking about uh, convening a regional meeting of, kind of industry and community stakeholders to discuss kind of the Commission's progress to so in other words I think um, and I'll defer to Council, Council Member Commissioner Christofferson as we discuss this too, uh, kind of the intent to bring uh, some accountability to the Commission and some kind of reporting out and engaging of the community uh, beyond just kind of being their own insular uh, city, you know, kind of city type commission, but actually engaging in and conversing with uh, the community as a whole. 
uh, specifically again to some of these key stake stakeholders. Under composition, uh, the, the Housing Opportunities Commission uh, would, is looking to be consisting of 11 members. Uh, one would be a city council member and the other 10 would be recommended through the customary procedure, the advisory committee appointments, and then confirmed by the city council. I should note that uh, it was just put onto the Citizen Resource Bank application online. There is a drop-down menu of all the different boards and commissions that one can request to be considered by that uh, advisory committee and appointments. And the Housing Opportunities Commission is now in that list. So happy to report that. There'll be some additional information put online. Again, this was just literally published formally yesterday. So uh, it is still, we're gonna provide some additional information online. So, so those who are interested in applying can read a little bit more rather than just reading the, the, the kind of the bland ordinance here. Uh, again, the commission in terms of composition is going to uh, focus on those with backgrounds, uh, again, Oakland residents with backgrounds as local developers, realtors, property managers, uh, those with public health uh, experience, background, social service providers or other applicable lived experience, and uh, one member with student housing lived experience as well. So again, there's diversity in terms of the membership and uh, communication and um, I guess input looking to be received by the commission. And then finally, I wanted to highlight the uh, duties and responsibilities. Again, this, this is where there will be a little bit of uh, interaction, perhaps, with the Planning Commission. Uh, the last item there under duties and responsibilities, the last section, I should say, items A, B, and E uh, really speak specifically, more specifically to the Planning Commission. So the following duties and responsibilities, item A, support goals of the City Council's strategic plan, which has essentially incorporated uh, a number of those housing recommendations and strategies from the task force. Uh, support the goals of the comprehensive plan, which then ties into the plan commission here. And then the city manager's work plan related to affordable housing. So that's kind of more the, the how-to uh, piece of the, essentially the city council strategic plan. Item B, review affordable housing policies and provide recommendations and comments to not just the city council, but also to the planning commission. So as we start looking at perhaps any kind of zoning code uh, amendments or recommendations, uh, other uh, policies that relate to the plan Commission's work, uh, there'll be some interaction there. And then item E talks about annually proposing to City Council for its review and adoption affordable housing goals and commission work plan based upon documented community need consistent with the comprehensive plan, strategic plan, and then also the Housing Task Force recommendations. So kind of tying that all back in and making it more of a uh, annual work plan type of uh, construction there for the commission moving forward so with that uh, any comments or questions about the housing uh, opportunities commission before I close out with some comments about next steps any questions or comments I have a couple okay um, so in terms of the definition of affordable housing, it says the average median growth, uh, 30 percent of the average median gross annual income. Um, I learned from Commissioner Wolfgram that uh, that hovers around fifty thousand dollars annual. But where, where does that statistic come from? The 30 percent? No, the average median gross annual income. Uh, How do we determine that? Where do where do actually spoke with, and I'll talk about this in the next steps, we spoke with uh, one of the state experts, uh, Dr. Kurt Paulson with uh, UW-Madison, and uh, there's a question posed to him, what type of number should we be utilizing for this annual median gross income? And uh, I don't want to say because he's a, a university professor because I'm sitting next to one. That, you, <laughs> that that was in that that world at some point, um, but he provided like a two-page response <laughs> of what that means. All that to say, uh, I kind of gleaned from that uh, really a lot. Of, and again, going back to the task force work as well, because there are a number of meetings that were spent on that. All that to say, uh, 
both uh, the HUD and the Census Bureau uh, provide a lot of that doc that a lot of that uh, uh, demographic information and income information. So we're pulling it down from more essentially nationally recognized uh, numbers, and a number of communities utilize those. Uh, figures to put together this type of information. So we're trying to be consistent in a broader sense, uh, but again, as Dr. Paulson was referring to, which is why it was a two-page response, was well, there's some there's some conflict between those, even between those numbers. So maybe no surprise to anybody, but uh, two federal. Uh, offices are disagreeing with each other, mm -hmm. but um, HUD and the Census Bureau's numbers don't necessarily always match up, is his point. So we try to be as consistent as possible with our regional partners and with our state agencies, and again with the federal uh, agencies as well. Okay. I just thought it would be would have been interesting to be a fly in the room when we were talking about that, because usually when you write an ordinance, if you have it just seems like an ordinance should have a basis for how where this comes from you know if you put out average median we, we want uh, their expense uh, I'm sorry refers to housing units and their related expenses that cost no more than 30 percent of the average median annual income mm -hmm. just as an observer I would recommend that based on st statistics from sure HUD and that or was, wherever and that was again not to you know really uh, minimize dr. Paulson's uh, input but that was uh, he had reviewed this as well as kind of a third-party observer interested mm -hmm. observer mentioned the same thing that if, if, if it's going to be very specific there should be a, a, a number that's chosen like you're saying and mm -hmm. referred to more specifically in and that'll change periodically exactly but but, you, but it seems like everybody has to have a number when the topic comes up sure and again here the intent was to be can we say refers to to be a little bit more broad because of that of that um, uh, differentiation even between again so-called experts in terms mm -hmm. of HUD and census even use different numbers so we didn't want to essentially pick a winner and say this is the absolute uh, answer okay but uh, again all that to say it's it's a bit of a fuzzy number admittedly so and we're admitting that here and the idea is we're trying to give a general perspective of what this should look like and then w was there any discussion about having a plan commission member on this commission there was initially, I believe, from uh, the two council members who are drafting this, uh, it, it, there, again, not to speak on their behalf, but uh, through the discussions we had, staff had with them, there was a strong interest, much like the Waterways and Parks Commission, to, f to form it uh, very much like that. So there's a council member uh, representing, but not a plan commission member. I think that's all I, <clears throat> I had. Any other questions from the Commissioner Peterson? Just for my own edification, um, because I think this can affect it greatly. What do they mean by resident? You know, you may have, we have college students down here living in the dorm that maybe Ma and Pa are, are totally undergirding all of their expenses. Um, might have a 16-year-old at home that works 10 hours a week. Might have a four-year-old at home. Are they a resident, or what? How do, is it just the working residents, or uh, any resident of Eau Claire would qualify? So, so a four-year-old would be a resident. Technically. Technically. Yes. Okay. So yes. whatever the population base is of Eau Claire is what this is Correct. divided by. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else before we move on to next steps? All right. All right. Thank you. So just real briefly with the uh, next steps, um, obviously quite a bit still going on. I mentioned that of kind of affordable housing fund. Uh, the city council has uh, uh, approved and appropriated uh, $500,000 through the capital improvement plan.
four uh, affordable housing initiatives. Uh, again, that being capital funds, capital dollars, uh, really looking at something more structural in nature, so to speak, not necessarily a program or uh, things of that sort, be more um, actual, um, real, uh, durable goods, so to speak, uh, for lack of a better term. So, been, again, that's where I mentioned uh, Dr. Paulson. Uh, also need to reference Erin uh, Healy, uh, continued her work that she did uh, last year on the uh, homelessness prevention effort and the 100-day sprint as a result of that. So we've been actually engaging uh, both of them uh, through this discussion. Uh, staff has been meeting, that was kind of what happened in December, not just the holidays, but also uh, meeting uh, at least weekly, uh, met with staff from the uh, finance department, as well as the uh, housing authority and housing division, and started talking about uh, kind of the, the real world, how do we apply, uh, and what are some options for this funding. So just to, to share that in a more uh, public sense, that staff is still working through that, and we'll be presenting something uh, for consideration some options to uh, City Council here shortly. So don't have a specific timeline yet, but we are working with a number of experts uh, to, to kind of get some some good kind of data points and uh, good real world examples that have been successful to present to the City Council. Along with that, referencing Dr. Paulson and his work, uh, we are looking to bring him up sometime in March for conversation uh, to the task force. So we'll make that a little bit broader um, invitation to planning commission members, city council and such, but really trying to form it and frame it as a task force meeting and bring him up and if not uh, at the task force meeting, perhaps a separate meeting with uh, you know, elected officials, appointed officials and such. So we're looking to bring him up for a good part of a, of a day, if not longer, perhaps. And uh, he's offered his services, experience, and knowledge to uh, enlighten us and with a lot of data and hopefully some uh, good guidance and direction from that. So look for that in March sometime. We're looking maybe mid-March, uh, trying to time it with uh, spring break and such, since he is uh, uh, teaching a number of classes as well. So. Anyway, just to, to share, that's where we're at right now. Uh, this is affordable housing fund, looking uh, shortly to pre present some ideas uh, for consideration to the city council, and then uh, bringing in Dr. Paulson for kind of our next uh, and first meeting of the task force here in 2020. So there we are. Perhaps uh, another update may be uh, worthwhile later this spring. Great. Thank you. Any other feedback from the commission? All right. Thank you. Uh, next item is code compliance items. Uh, future agenda items. I may s just throw out there, uh, also this spring, April, will be uh, new appointments, reappointments. So I know uh, Mr. Petrie, uh, Angie, others perhaps may have already been uh, speaking with you about uh, opportunities um, for that. So uh, if you have any questions, let me know, let Ryan know, uh, Angie know, uh, in terms of your current status, uh, in terms of reappointments, uh, and we can kind of clarify that. And if you are certainly interested and know you are available and uh, for a reappointment, certainly let us know as well. Thank you to those who've already done that. Thank you. And uh, additions or corrections to the minutes. All right, seeing none, without objection, this meeting is adjourned. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the City of Eau Claire. A transcript of this meeting is available for the hearing impaired. 
It will be available within seven days of this telecast. Call 715-839-4912 or TDD 715-839-1689 or write Eau Claire City Clerk, P.O. Box 5148, Eau Claire, Wisconsin 54702-5148. Newsworks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org. 